Okay, so we're recording for a little intro to Rhino demo from uh, the MARC students. We're going to start out with Julian. Julian, take us away. Okay, so I'm going to, my plan was to give you guys a rundown on building with Django blocks in Rhino and some really basic stuff. And since that was your homework over the weekend, this is probably going to be pretty repetitive. Um, so just real quick, some basic Rhino sort of movement around, you know, right click gives you this nice rotation. If you shift click, you get a nice pan, scroll wheel or zoom, and control right click is this smoother sort of zoom. So when you're like really trying to get up in the nooks and crannies of a model, I find that's the best way to do it. So we're going to start in top. We're going to draw our rectangle with a polyline. I just use the polyline tool over here. I really rarely use the toolbar. Um, I mostly just type in commands because I find it's a lot quicker, but for the polyline and Boolean union, they're just right there. So we're going to do zero, zero for start points. I'm going to do three inches because that's how long a Django block is and hold shift to lock it into orthogonal for that particular command. Then one inch and three inches again, and then just connect it. All right. Uh, now that we got this guy, I'm going to, uh, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. I'm going to alt click this over here and say two inches, and it's going to create a copy over here. Select my curve and do planar surf to turn this into a surface. I'm going to delete the curve because oops, no, we don't want to have a whole bunch of stuff here it's getting all confusing. I'm going to switch over to perspective view now. I'm going to do most of the work over here. So, oh, see how the zoom is all kind of funky now? It's not really around what I'm working on. I found this super helpful is the little magnifying glass with the two yellow dots in it. Now all of my sort of camera commands are around whatever my selection was when I hit that. That I use all the time. So now we're going to do extrude surf and we're going to type in 0 0.6 inches because that is what I found the height of my Django blocks to be. Presumably yours is too, but you'll also see that up the, at the top here you can do both sides. You can do solid yes, no, delete input, things like that. Um, but I'm not going to mess with any of that right now. There's some cool stuff you can do. Move this guy over two inches. I like to do, do uh, most of my work this way as sort of a workflow so that I always have my last step to go back on in case I do something. Usually I only do this if I'm going to do something that's destructive that I can't really go back on, but just for the sake of showing what's going on. So now we're going to create another Django block over here using the alt click to gumball move. And uh, I have a question. Yes. So whenever I would like um, extrude something, it would like extrude only the walls and it like wouldn't extrude the top. Yeah, so that's like how you extrude surf here. That's the solid option up here. If it's on no, you're gonna get this sort of box thing, right? It's just the- just Yeah, the wait, solid. where's the solid option? It is, you know, I'll go back here, extrude surf. It's in this this uh, toolbar up here, or the okay. console, or whatever it is. Solid. You just click on that yes, and then your extrusion will be solid. Thanks. Anytime, anytime that you have a command and you if if it has like multiple settings, it'll have a default setting. But if you just type in the command, the command. So for example, Zoom has several commands. All dynamic extents factor. You can see it right there. And so if you do the selected, it'll kind of it'll put the, the target of the camera on the thing that is selected as being the center default. But you can see that, that the zoom, Zoom's like kind of um, default setting is just dynamic. Like it'll just zoom in and out with the center wherever the center seems to be right now. And if you, so if you just kind of type a command, wait just half a moment, it'll give you the options. Um, Rhino is really friendly in that the best way to check out the options is just to check them out, which sounds like a, a highly untechnical way of exploring, but it basically means that Rhino rewards your curiosity. So if you are like, what does this command do? Just like making a little cube off to the side and doing that thing on the command can usually lead students to the most uh, beneficial experience. So I would encourage that you that you do that. So there's like, there's almost two layers to every command. Like the first layer is the name of the command itself. The second layer is these like options within it that you can do. I yeah. also have a question. Oh, go ahead, Maya. So what's the difference between just like extruding the surface and using the, um, the box tool? 
Uh, so with extrude the surface, you get sort of a more controlled um, outcome, right? So if I just do the box tool, if I just pick this guy over here and then just like draw a shape, I don't know what the dimensions of that are. Uh, and I guess I could import them. Let's find out. I've never actually tried. So you can. See. So as you click, the next click, it'll actually ask you for the link. So you can see there's the second layer of the onion. Exactly. You're onto it. There we go. And then can I do one inch after that? Nope. Oh, oh yeah, because yeah. the measurements, I think they're in the bottom left there corner. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. You can, every time you can just put in a new one. So, and the, the measurements are always going to be working in the positive direction of the axes. So that's why it's building it out the way that you had it um, there, Julian, because it's moving the positive axes. Now, the other thing to to know guys is that there's so while these two geometries which is what kind of our nickname is for talking about these spaces look the same one of these things is not like the other um so the box is a volume which mean that it's which means that it's actually solid whereas the extrusion is hollow so if if um julian and you can show us this by typing explode yeah and then getting rid of one of the surfaces. So now Julian can grab one of the surfaces and open it up and you can see that it's a box. Now, one of the important things to know about Rhino, now when you explode that, do you see how, do you guys see how all of a sudden, so just if you can undo Julian. So see guys how there are no little tiny lines on the inside, those are called ISO curves. So since that has no ISO curves, it means that it's just a volume. If you hit explode, it actually turns it into six surfaces. And it's now exactly like the extrusion and it's hollow on the inside. And those ISO curves are like kind of details showing you which direction the surface goes. So there's X, Y, and Z for modeling space. And then there's actually, a, there's actually a grid system that's applied to every sur surface called the UV. And it acts as its own grid. If you're confused by that, don't worry, we'll get to that a little bit later. But it's important to realize that a box is a volume and it's basically treated as solid. And then a extrusion is hollow. And it's important to understand that the skin of that computer extrusion has a thickness of nothing. So, so a, a point exists in one particular point with no width, length, or depth. A surface is a plane that exists in length and width without thickness. A volume exists with length, width, and thickness. But an extrusion is a collection of six surfaces and therefore has no volume. It encloses a volume, it describes a volume that's inside of it, but it itself actually has no volume. And that's important because to our eyes, that looks like a box. But to the computer, and this is important, to the computer, there is an inside and an outside, but there is no in-between. There's only inside and outside, there is no thickness. So that's actually an excellent point, Maya. Thank you, because later on, I was going to say, if you guys have better ways of doing things, please let me know, because I imagine you'll think of them as we're going along. Actually, can I join this? Yeah, there we go. Because um, Rhino is sort of just about doing things, and then you go back and realize, oh, there's a better way of doing this. So to make the next step into making this a Jenga piece is to curve our edges, round our edges. I had been working with uh, the not curved edges before, um, but I thought, why not? For the, for the purposes of the demo, it's kind of nice. So here I highly recommend shift clicking even the first one, because if you just click it, it's going to start dragging stuff all over the place and it gets confusing and annoying. So now that we have all our tails clicked, we're gonna pick one to sort of just drag down and you'll see, kind of hard to see, there you go. The, the uh, white there, and that's gonna project our curve and when I let go it does it for all of them you hit enter and boom you got a Jenga block move this guy over now to make a few more Jenga blocks we're going to do the ray command I want three in the x direction only one in the y direction and three in the z direction and I want then it's going to ask you for your uh, distance between them one in the x direction and then 0.6 in the z direction. There you go, you got a nice little stack of finger blocks. I'm gonna move this guy over, let's say five inches. And I'm 
going to start moving around these Django blocks. If you so you'll notice that if you select from the dragon to the left, left or right to left, it selects anything that you go over. But if you drag from right to left or from left to right, it only selects things you encompass entirely. So that is a neat little uh, helpful tool for selecting things in different ways. Also, I noticed that in Rhino, interest. Um, undo is the same as in pretty much every other program, right? It's control Z, but redo is control Y for whatever reason. I don't know. That's the way they wanted to do it. So I'm just sort of playing with these blocks and moving them around. Oh yeah, I was gonna move this guy up 25 inches. And this guy down, negative 25 inches. Oops, that's not a point. Cool. So we have this sort of thing in here. I'm just going to keep doing steps just to sort of, oh no, that is not what I wanted to do. And we're going to do some rotating stuff. So here, your gumball is for all of your selection. And I want to rotate all of these 90 degrees. So I just click on the red bar because if you just drag it, you can, you get this sort of free rotation, uh, which isn't accurate, but it can be fun to mess around with. If you click it, you can enter uh, an exact degree amount. If you hit yeah. shift when you're dragging it to rotate, it'll lock to 90 degrees. Yeah, shift is just generally uh, orthogonal lock for any command in which it is applicable. So I just know this is a trial and error that point one is the remaining distance to make it flush with the surface. You could do move, but I find that with move, uh, move is kind of a, an iffy command uh, because it goes based off of your locks that are down here and the locks in Rhino tend to be kind of difficult. You might want to use start using control lines, construction lines and things like that to help get more accurate locks. Like if you're going to do a twist in particular, you definitely want to draw a line straight down the center of whatever object you're doing. Because if you have like a solid and you're trying to make rotate like a rectangle, you can't just click the top, the center of the top. Um, so here I'm going to do Boolean union, which is these two circles over here, and it's going to make them all group together and individual objects. So you'll see that if I explode this, right, I have each one of these is now, oh, it should be a surface. I guess it's not. Anyway. <laughs> Gonna move that over five inches, maybe seven. And rotate these guys. Um, one thing that if you guys ever figure out how to do, please let me know, is move objects towards each other or away from each other and not in exactly the same direction. Uh, I haven't figured it out. I haven't done too much work on it. But I think it would be really useful for things like right that instead of right there, instead of um, doing each 1.5 inches, just having them move together uh, all in one command. Mirror. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Perfect. I will remember that. And then I'm going to do this negative three inches. And we got a copy over there. Easy. Make another copy with the uh, uh, alt click. And then plop this guy over was it 2.5 inches and negative 2.5 inches. So there's like a we no forgot the alt. So there's like a really simple just building with Jenga. Um, if you want to get like a nice little nicer look to it, you can just do the drop down render. It looks a little prettier. I mean, it's not pretty good with Jenga. Can you just uh, hover on that for a moment just to show us that there's some different options there? Wireframe, shaded, render, ghosted, x-ray, technical, artistic, pen, arctic, ray traced, new mode. Uh, can you just do the wireframe just for a moment just to show us what that looks like? Or I think then who's going to go over some of that stuff. All first. right. Excellent. Excellent. So I just wrote on the screen, which is actually really handy because when I'm teaching you guys, I can't do that. So I just wanted to point out a couple of the commands um, that Julian's going through. Now, Julian, you weren't this fast when you started, but you started not that many weeks ago um, using Rhino, right? Before that, had you used Rhino before? 
No, I learned Rhino in, we had to learn it in like two days. Yes. Not really learn it, but like, you know, we had a crash course in two days and then it was like, okay, you had two days of practice and now you have an assignment to do with it. Right. So, yeah. so I just want to point out that like, you, you know, it's, you've spent just a little bit more time than the undergrads in this class, but it's not let you just like super are comfortable with this. You've just, you've practiced. So it'll come with practice and exploration. And so if you guys are like, oh my God, what did he just say? Don't worry, we're recording it so that we can possibly share it. And I'm gonna write down some of the commands that are important on the screen. And one of your classmates has also written down a bunch of the commands. Thank you, Morgan, for, for that stuff. So should we transfer over to who's next? Yeah, and I just wanna say that like, it really is about practice because the first time I even did this model, I just took the Jenga block and I did a rate three in the X direction. And then I took that three pair and a rate at three in the Z direction. And I was like, oh, I'm an idiot. I could do both of these arrays in the same command. So really it's just like doing it over and over and realizing, oh, there is a better, faster way to do it. And that's going to happen. It's always that way. So. Magenta, magenta on gray is a horrible color combination, but I just want to underscore, don't worry. It's about practicing, all right? If you don't feel like you're getting it down, don't worry. It's about practicing. Trust me, you guys made really ugly cardboard models before you made really beautiful cardboard models. All right, who's next? I guess I am, right? <laughs> all right. Yeah, let, me, uh, let me get set up real quick. So has anybody got questions as Minwoo is kind of getting settled there? Uh, one of the other things I would just say while you're thinking of your questions is that Julian was altering the way that his click works, it's just like in Photoshop or in AutoCAD by holding down the control, the shift or the alternate button, you'll, you'll kind of enable different commands. Like it'll lock to a grid or it'll open up a special command or it'll kind of bind it so that it's working in a kind of a quote smarter way. So that's something else that you guys can think of. Um, uh, again, it's trial and error. It's about getting kind of comfortable with it. It took me a long time to get comfortable with the fact that spacebar in the world of AutoCAD and Rhino, spacebar is enter, which doesn't make sense because enter is enter. But in this world, spacebar is also enter. So this is a this is a file that Julian shared with us uh, over the weekend. So it may look different, but Oh, well, <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna, so like before I get into anything, like sometimes like Rhino is gonna be like a huge pain in the butt and it's going to set in different units. So the way that you wanna change your units is uh, in this middle bar right here, you wanna click the, the yellow gear for options and then go down to units and then make sure like inches is on or your uh, desired uh, way of measuring because um, who knows you might use millimeters and you're better at that <laughs> but anyway um, so I'm just going to expand on what Julian's uh, been making where so let's say you want to make some experience shots uh, to render and you know put into Illustrator or Photoshop to get some like to get some color or put in some scale figures or what have you um, so Let's just do it like right here, right? Uh, uh, an option could be like the Windows print screen, like uh, screen capturing this, but you don't wanna ever screen capture anything in Rhino because you know, A, you're gonna spend a lot of time cropping the image, but also like um, when you need to go back to this exact spot, you're going to spend like 10 to 10, 30 minutes or probably an hour trying to get to this exact spot. And for these reasons as well. So the way that you want to save like where you left off in this specific camera view is with this command uh, named view. And by the way, I have a Cherry MX keyboard. So you guys are gonna be hearing that clackety clackety. Um, and then you wanna click save as, and then we can just do it as perspective one. And it saves right there. And like, let's say like I need to, like I'm moving around and oh, like I wanna go back to that specific spot. Go back to named view, double click this. 
right there. And it doesn't even matter like if you edit your model in any sort of way possible. Like if I just delete that and go back to name view, it takes me to the same spot. No problem. Um, so next is, okay, like I have this specific view and I want to, uh, yeah, exactly. And I want to now render it. Uh, so what I want to do is back to this, uh, back to the center toolbox toolbar right here. I want to right click on this blue sphere and it gives you a whole array of different options to, for you guys to render. But before that, actually before that, before I do that, before I start rendering, um, I want to show you guys how you can add light and shadow into your models because I know like Andrew loves that. And you, you would use the command sun. Not only does Andrew love it, professors love it. Not only do professors love it, you love it. I actually really love this. Like I actually really love this command. Um, so you can turn it on. Um, it's not going to work on the shade, shaded view. It's only, it's going to work on rendered view though, right? So I turn this on and you can set like your location. So let's say Philadelphia, right? And then you can set the time of day. Uh, let's go for September at around like 1.37 PM. Like you, you notice how like the shadow moves as time goes on. And if you don't like, uh, if you don't like a specific area and you're like, oh, like I just want free control over the sun, you can turn on manual control and you can control the azimuth, you can control the altitude, you can just freehand it like this. So I'm just gonna, yeah, that's good. And that's good. Cool. This is, this is a really excellent way of demonstrating like how sun angle change throughout the year. Um, it's really fantastic when you do the, the, um, the earth map and you can kind of see how, depending on where your site is, cause you can actually click on that map as well to dynamically get to where your position is. So you can like select the city, but you can also just click on the map and it'll take you to the closest positions and you'll see, um, Minwoo, if you can go down to that map. Yeah. Yeah. I love how it changes. It, it actually performs twilight. Like it'll show you in that light, light bar, um, just up a half step right there. So it'll show you twilight and the golden hour and all that stuff. It'll also show you versus the year, how the golden hour and light changes. So like if we did it for today, sunset today is like 705. Um, and you'll actually see like how much twilight you get when the light starts changing and shifting but you can also see the fact that like in july it's still full daylight and in november it's already dark and i think that that's really important because the sun angle is also changing so sometimes you know the place and the time but maybe not the sun angles or you know the sun angles that you are designing for but you don't know what time of year that the, they're going to enact kind of enact um we saw out on the site last week we saw a breeze soleil which is a light shade that sticks out horizontally from the building and it's designed to allow the building to have sunlight during the winter months and then shade it during the hot months and if you were to model that bris soleil here and then run this as kind of a solar um, daylighting survey you could actually see how it works and that means that not only is this a valuable tool for like getting lighting effects but it can also be used for designing like if you want shadow in a certain area during a certain time you can adjust it so this is really really valuable thank you yeah, and you know, if you don't want to be bound by the the concept of time, you can always uh, just do it manually. Unbind so, yourself I, from the concepts of time and space and gravity with the powers of rhinoceros. So yeah, I, I like I like to I like to make sure like my shadows are really long. I like that. Uh, so and if I if I click X, like it'll save automatically. Like it'll save it to there. No big deal. So now I'm going to go back to my name view and I'm going to go back to perspective one. So yeah, like you can see a little bit of that light here, the shadows going on right here, right? So like, don't screen grab this, you want to render it, right? So I click on, I right click on this uh, blue sphere right here. 
and it gives you a huge array of different options. You could even like change the background color to like blue if you want to, uh, or gray or white, right? And then um, you can change the viewport, like you can change the dimension. We can do like 1920 by 1080 if you want. Um, change the DPI, always do 150 at least. And then you can change the quality of your, uh, of your render. Um, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna do a draft quality because that's probably the fastest besides from low. Um, but you don't wanna turn in a draft quality image because this is what it's gonna look like. You can see like how it's all like grainy and not that, not well done. If you change, if you change it to final quality, it's going to look sharper. It's going to look less grainy. Um, and that's going to, and then you can, you know, put it into Photoshop and Illustrator to do some touching up. And then to save this uh, specific image, you want to click the save as button, type in, uh, example and then there you go and then now like I can pull up my uh, I can pull up my my photo into Illustrator or Photoshop and uh, do other things yes please please do this do this always always, <laughs> always always no matter what it is year year month month day day always because if you lose a file, you can still find it by doing a name search. Because if you open a file that you made last year and you change it in any way, the computer thinks that it was changed the day that you made that change. So let's say think that you it's next year. And actually, the reason why you're doing this is for your future self. All right. Your future self will thank you for being organized because your future self is like, oh, my God, I need to make a portfolio. What did I do last year? And you want to quickly look up and know what it is. And you are going to be hating yourself when you're like, is it final draft? Is it final, final draft? Is it final, final, final print this one stupid draft? Is it, Andrew, I told you that this was the final last draft forever. Draft or final? So just name it with the year, month, and day. And then you can even do like A, B, C. You know, it can be like hurricanes. You can get into naming it alpha and beta. Um, but that works a lot better just as a baseline. Eventually, you'll develop your own method of organization. But until you do that, just do year, year, month, month, day, day. Um, that's essential. Yeah. And one last thing. Um, I know like axonometrics are a big thing, um, especially like when you have like an array of, of uh, models like this. And so like maybe like your professor wants to see like all, your whole you know, array of, of models here. So I would go into this drop down button and then set view, isometric, and then you can choose from any one of these selections. Um, let's see, Southeast. Yeah, that's good. And then you can, you know, uh, and then you can uh, render that and then. And I just want to call out this for just a moment. So before, Julian, you were modeling in a perspective view, and the default view is perspective, and we tend to just go with the defaults. When you guys are designing, I think it's much more helpful to design in a parallel projection. Um, so if you could just go through that one more time and move really slow, just click on that chevron, pull down to set view, over and down to isometric, and you can set that as any of those views. It's really helpful to model in a non-perspectival view. The reason is because if you're in a perspective, you can throw something to the horizon. Well, in a perspective, the horizon is infinitely far away. So a couple things happen. Number one, your computer is going to try its best to throw that object to infinity, which is going to make your file size really large because it doesn't matter how tiny your model is. If something exists infinitely long away, your file size is infinitely big. The other thing that it is going to do is it's going to slow down your computer while it's trying to figure out how far away that object is. So you're going to get some stutter in the frame rate that projects onto your computer. And the last reason that you shouldn't do it is because it gives something to your computer to snap to that's so far off screen that it might seem like it's a straight up and down line, but it actually might be 0 0.001 degrees off of perpendicular. And that becomes really important when you want things to line up or be on a column grid or later on when you want to 3D print stuff. And you need stuff to align perfectly 
And it's so close that it looks like it aligns, but it doesn't. And there's no way for you to tell except completely rebuilding the model. And so you're like, ah, former younger self, why did you name this final, final, final? And why did you put something at infinite with distance away? It's a very common mistake to make. It's very easy to just get into the practice of, there's a couple things that, that you guys are doing here that are excellent. And I know that you're excellent because you learn from the people that I train. So one is after every step, just copy and paste your stuff over. That way you can show your work. That way you can get credit for your work. Name and save your views and what it is that you're working on. Make sure that you save it at a good DPI and give a good file name. And then lastly is design in an isometric or a parallel projection. That's those things. If you guys do those things, it keeps the model resilient and then it allows you to explore, which makes life fun. If you don't do those things, it makes the model kind of twitchy and it makes life very frustrating. And it also means that it's really hard for me to help you when you're having questions. These are really good. Yeah, and uh, Steph and Betty are gonna show you like how you can adjust line weights like from Rhino into like in, in Illustrator from Rhino. Uh, and Betty's gonna show you like how to how to touch up everything in Photoshop. Like she, she sent us like a, 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 a demo image uh, like over text and we were like yo this is really good <laughs> so yeah i'm gonna stop right here <laughs> all right so um and this is cool because some people are already starting to share some of their uh backgrounds and this is what's so powerful about this class is that you guys are going to explore using tools in different ways and what we're going to need what we're going to need to do is be vocal about how we're exploring because normally what we could do in class is i could say yeah, bring up a cool tool that you made today and just put it you know doo -doo, put it up on your screen and we can walk around and check stuff out now we need to make sure that we're sharing stuff and i gotta say that julian and minwoo and izzy figured out that they can use my Zoom room by just logging in, letting me know that they're there and I can set it up and make screen sharing enabled so that they can do, you know, you can have collaborative sessions um, without a time limit, which is kind of nice. So that's an Easter egg that will embed in the middle of this video. Um, awesome. I'm going to ask if, um, if uh, you guys can share this link to this video in the chat so I can make sure to embed it in the video. Absolutely. Um, just one disclaimer, when I uploaded it to YouTube, it got a little fuzzier than it originally was, but here we Always go. happens. It's all good. <laughs> now that you've finished your round, everyone here? I'll show you how to export the line work so you can post-process it in Adobe Illustrator. First, make sure your viewports are set to top for plan, front for elevation, and left or right for section. Next, you're going to type in the command make 2D. Highlight your design and press enter. A dialog box will appear. Under projection, select view. Under options, select from input objects, tangent, edges, group output, and register with previous. If you don't select these, it may not pick up all the lines in your design, which will make more work later. A 2D projection will be created and visible in the top viewport. Move this nearby, but out of the way for now. Repeat these steps for the elevation. To make a section, create a clipping plane, simply by typing in clipping plane to the command bar. Create a rectangle around your work, a little wider and a little taller than the design itself. Adjust accordingly. I usually slice the design right through the middle. Now make your new section into 2D line work. Before exporting, I like to arrange my designs in an organized way, usually a vertical line. I like to put my elevation under the plan so that I can eventually make construction lines connecting the two. Select all three designs and go to File, Export Selected, and Save as an Adobe Illustrator file. It's also a good practice to save your Rhino work as well. Now go to Adobe Illustrator and open the file you just created. Enlarge your designs by expanding while holding down the shift key. Otherwise, it'll free transform and distort your line work. 
the first thing you should do is inspect for any out of place lines. Usually there are at least one or two to fix, like this one right here. You can use the eraser tool or just manually shorten the line back into place. Now, line weights are important for conveying depth, especially in a section. Parts that are closer should be thicker and parts that are farther away should be thinner. Select the stroke panel to the right of your dashboard and adjust the line weights here. You can also make arrows and dashed lines from this panel as well. The great thing about exporting from Rhino is that it saves each line individually so you can select them easily instead of having to trace your entire design. To thicken a line, use the direct selection tool, which is the second mouse down from the top on the left tool panel. Select the lines that you want while holding down shift and increase the line weight. So finally, I'll just briefly walk you through how to make construction lines in Illustrator. Go back to the stroke panel to the right of your dashboard and check off dashed line. Under the dash quantity, four is a pretty good number. And you're gonna to wanna to turn the opacity down to about 60%. And the line weight of a construction line should be no more than 0.75, but I think 0.5 is usually subtle enough. Now that your strokes are set properly, use the pen tool to start creating a bunch of horizontal and vertical construction lines and copy and paste those into place. Construction lines should be used to accentuate features of your design. And you'll end up with something like this. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it. Thank you for letting me troll your video. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> construction lines construction lines are so important and it's one of the things that shows how you're thinking about stuff. The other thing is is that you can actually make construction lines in Rhino ahead of time. I oftentimes make I oftentimes make a layer that is called construction lines um, and I put it on for things to snap to to align with. I put notes on there. I will write notes to my future self, like, cause I might have to take, you know, a couple days off or work on a different project and my headspace might change. So I want those on a layer that I can turn off that I don't need all the time, but that I keep for myself. But I oftentimes turn those on and then do click and hold for the line weights and make those into their own construction lines. Construction lines are like, they're the connective tissue, they're the glue, they're the neuro pathways to show us how relationships exist on your model. They are essential, they're not optional. And putting them on makes the drawing feel like it's grounded on the paper, even when that paper's digital. Very cool. Next up. I think Seema. Oh, Seema. Yeah, Seema has her hand raised. Ah, Seema's got a question. I can't figure out how to lower my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Seema's question is, how do you lower your hand? Uh, have, it's on it. participants. It's in participants, and you can click uh, lower your hand. I can also lower it for you if you want. Okay, yeah, because I only see raised hand. My hand's already raised. <laughs> That's all right. I've got you lowered now, Seema. Do you have a question? Or is no, your question I was gonna just ask, how to lower my hand? <laughs> no, I was going to ask Steph to share the link, but she did, so I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. I have my hand raised and I can't take it down. Um, Betty, are you up next? Yes. Thank I you so am. much. Okay. Can you guys see this? Yes. Okay. So as Minwoo said, um, I took on the Photoshop aspect of this sequence. And it's just, this is showing how I took uh, Julian's model and then turned it into something like a space that's inhabited by other things. So I started off by dropping in the image and then going into layers and rasterizing it so I can edit. And then I took out the background using the magic eraser tool and then resizing it and like putting it off center. And then duplicate, so like when I duplicate the layer, it allows. Um, a copy to like that I can put 
and always go back to if I wanted to restart. And then also, and then I have like a copy that I can edit directly on top of. So that's what I did there. And then for this part, I wanted to darken this side right here. So like by using the quick selection tool, I was able to select most, like all of it. And then I went in, like it selected parts where I didn't want to and I just deselected by pressing down alt and just clicking on those areas and it automatically deselected. And then once like I have all the correct areas that I want to select, um, I went and used the brush tool, which will show up in a minute. <laughs> and I used like the darken mode and setting the opacity to 30 and I set it lower so I'm able to build up that uh, intensity rather than having it be super dark all in one go. It just allowed me more control and how dark I wanted something to be. And like, I just went over it multiple times to achieve that darkness. So this part I like lowered, I started with 30 and then I went down by 10% to continue building up. that contrast. This is really nice to just see how you have to slowly build up stuff. And I think that it means that you need to be patient, but it also means that like you can work and if you don't like something, you can always back up. And mm -hmm. also knowing that your skill set is both in the model and like so we're saving that view like Minwoo did, but also that we can use stuff in Photoshop. And there is no answer to do one or the other. You can use both. And so if you're more comfortable in Photoshop, you can set up your view and really work on it in Photoshop. If you're starting to get more facile with the computer, you can work in the computer. It's also important to realize that like, maybe if you're not as good with one, you just need to make sure that you give yourself time to practice with that muscle so you can get better at it too. And so working between the programs, because remember, it's not really about mastery of any of these programs. It's about communicating your idea. And so you need to use all of the tools in your digital toolbox to communicate clearly. So once that was dark enough, I applied the um, hue and saturation tone or filter to lower that yellowish orange tone of the actual model itself because I didn't like, and it looked too much like a Jenga thing. And then, so when I took out the background, I wanted to add in this green grassy background to make it feel more like it's an architecture on like some grass to give it more of that like park garden vibe. And so like I resized it and then just made sure to give it a little perspective. So it fits in with uh, the model itself and not like it's, it's not just floating there. And then I also lowered that, um, the vibrancy of the green um, using like the level, uh, the brightness and the heat saturation hue. To, so it's a little more muted, so it doesn't like pop out as much. And like the, that way the focus is really on the model itself rather than that green background. And then because this, I was going for an architecture vibe, I wanted to create some sort of pathway that led to the structure and then out of the structure. So there would be pathways going from the back or from the front to the structure and then from the structure out to the back. And so I found this um, 
pattern, this highway layout on Google. I brought it into Photoshop. And I'm, what I'm ultimately doing is taking that shape of this uh, highway pattern and cutting it using that form with the, that I got using the selection tool. I cut that shape out of the concrete image that is there. And so then the path that's create that the image of the path, it's of the concrete texture, but it's the shape of that highway structure. And then I just kind of uh, transformed it and add a little perspective again so it doesn't look like it's something randomly floating in the image, but it actually fits into the space. And I found that using, um, so there's two ways doing perspective that I know of in Photoshop. One is to use the actual perspective tool under edit. And then the other is just to hold down command or control, depending on which, if you're on Mac or PC, and then just you uh, clicking on the transformation points at the end of the image. And you could just drag and pull. And it's, I found that it's much faster. And then here I was, um, I was creating, using the stamp tool, I filled in some of the areas that I wanted the concrete material to extend out to rather than um, it just being green. And then I just duplicated that path onto the back. So then I was like, it's like one, like you're going into the structure and then out. Again, adjusting like the perspective and the size to make it fit, make it work. I think it's really smart that um, Betty that you're sampling from samples and so you're using the shapes that you found in one photograph that have design features that you want and you're using the texture and color from other layers and then you're adjusting them to make them your own and this is really important because if we were just copying directly that would be dangerously getting into kind of copying other people's work but here you're changing it so much that the original photographer I don't even think would recognize the outline of the subject that they took the photo of because you've changed it so completely. And that's really important. And also working in a way that gets you closer to your idea, right? These aren't the exact pathways, but it gets you to the idea of what it is that you want so that you can start designing that stuff. And I think it's really helpful because really the objective is to work on the architecture here, but allowing it to be grounded gets you a little bit closer to figuring it out. So it's really helpful to see all that stuff kind of coming together, right? Some things are loose, some things are tighter. Everything gets an appropriate attention to detail and everything is getting careful craft. And then after that, I, in um, Photoshop, I realized there was actually this feature with trees where you can actually drop in trees. And like, I thought it was really cool. So I added those trees and to kind of just populate the space a little bit with something other than grass. Um, so I just dropped in the oak tree, a couple oak trees and lightened it up manually um, by just selecting it and then using the brush tool to lighten where like the sun would, the direction that the sun would hit the tree in.
So I'm just going to pipe up and uh, while we're watching the trees come in, you can also make your own trees and I encourage you to build up your own library of entourage. I really like that Betty has her kind of like entourage parking lot file where she's kind of like keeps her stuff ready to kind of move on over. I think that's a really great practice. The other thing that I would, I would say is that some of the automated tools like grass, like magnetic wand, like magic wand, like the tree tool. I call them Spider-Man tools because if you know your Spider-Man with great power comes great responsibility. And Spider-Man gets told that because with great power, there's a chance for it to be enticing to kind of reuse it or use it kind of irrationally or irresponsibly. Here, Betty, to get across your idea, which is a vignette model project in a quick output where you wanna get an impression across to people, this is a perfect option to use the tree tool. But to use the tree tool at a higher level would be necessary if we were looking for something that was more polished. Now, for this first part of getting to know Rhino, it's about working quickly, it's about iterating, and it's about translating those ideas so you can get feedback quickly and efficiently. As we start to move through the semester and as your abilities increase, I wanna make sure that you guys are spending the time to get across the things that are most important to you. And if you wanna know another way of making trees, just check out the digital demos online. There's a great example at, towards the end of how to photograph and clean up your drawings that shows you how to draw your own tree and how to Photoshop your own trees. You can make those into entourage. You can put them in a parking lot file, just like Betty's doing here. So again, it's just, uh, I, I'm, I'm not critiquing it. I'm saying this is a good tool. Make sure that you know when to use it. And then I was, I went in and just added some shadows to the tree so they don't look so flat by using the brush tool again. It's amazing how that makes such a big difference. Mm -hmm. They're no longer floating. And you're putting in the shadow in the same way that the sun and the light is coming from a certain direction and the shadow is falling in a certain direction. Yes. That's really important. Knowing where north is, knowing where the sun is moving across your site is gonna be incredibly important. We have so many tools which will show us how the sun moves. There's no excuse not knowing how to do it. Yeah. And then the last thing was to populate it with some scaled figure to kind of make it really feel like a space that you can be in. Wow, and look at how it changes when you scale it, those people down through different levels of scale from like, four times what they were to half of what they were to half again what they were. What a huge impact that has. Also having scale figures that are in action, walking, sitting, talking to each other, pointing at each other, helps demonstrate how the space is getting utilized. And the more scale figures that you have doing that, that are populating your site, the better off you are. Um, one of the things that classes have done in the past is actually sharing their entourage, sharing their skill figures with everybody, because that way you can multiply the effort that you do. If everybody in this class cuts out a scale figure in a pose, walking, sitting, waving, throwing a Frisbee, and shares it with everyone else in class, we can times by 15 the amount of work that you just got. And you now have 15 scale figures that you can put into your class, into your stuff. Now that might not mean that the f person throwing the Frisbee goes into every single one, but perhaps you guys have seen the, the thing that we call the Philly U birds. They're on a lot, a lot of renderings. And it's because this file of birds was floating around on the server forever and everybody put it in and it was like this Anyway, I don't even know why I just went over it because now I said the words and now it will come back to haunt me. Anyway, what I'm saying though is you guys can actually really access each other to use to make more skill figures. 
there's also a couple scale figure resources I will go over later in the semester. And that's important too. Um, knowing where you're getting your scale figures from and making sure that you're representing a, an accurate and a diverse and a demographically correct amount of scale figures, even when they're in silhouette, is important. And it's a way that um, we can kind of help make sure that we're designing and using our space conscientiously and intentionally. We'll talk about that more later this semester. But yeah, that's it for um, editing Julian's model in Photoshop. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Julian and Minwoo and Steph and Betty for sharing that with us. Is there any more questions? Um, oh yeah, I, I will shout out to the history tab, which is up there in Windows. And, uh, and you can always have the history tab. It'll save the last 50 things that you've done. And that's really great. Um, if you're on a Mac, it'll save longer than that. Um, but it'll save the last, um, at least the last 50 that you've done since you saved, closed, and opened the file. It won't save it beyond the session that you're in, but it is super valuable. Um, AutoCAD will actually save everything you've done since you opened the file, which is pretty intense. Um, and, uh, and Rhino will save everything, like I think about the last 100 commands since you've saved the file, um, which is really nice. It should mean that you should never feel like you can't save, like you can't back up, like you can't experiment and do something wrong. So the only other thing that I would add to this demonstration. I'll unveil myself now. The only other thing that I would add to this demonstration is to be sure that when you're working on a file, set some kind of alarm or indicator for yourself every seven to 10 minutes to save your file. Um, the other thing that you can do to help yourself out a lot, especially when you're working in Rhino, especially when you're working in Photoshop, especially when you're working with a heavy vector file in, in Illustrator turn off the stuff that's running in the background. So don't have a lot of tabs open. Don't have your email popping up and getting in the way of your thought process. Um, I like to listen to music. Um, so I actually have, I usually second screen my tutorials. So I will bring up tutorials on like my phone or, um, or I will stream on like a smart speaker. And that keeps the bandwidth and the processing power of my computer dedicated to my model. Um, it makes the model less glitchy. It makes the, the workflow smoother. Um, it keeps me focused and it, it speeds up. And it basically, it saves you minutes over the course of tens of minutes because that slowness actually kind of like impedes your learning. So again, I would just say like, turn off the YouTube or the Netflix, second screen that stuff. Um, to, to keep your computer operating cleanly. Um, another thing is, is that when I'm working on Rhino, I always try to be plugged in. Um, it doesn't overheat my laptop as much. It doesn't work out my battery as much, so my battery lasts longer. Um, again, we're, we want, I want your laptop to last you as long as possible in your academic career. So staying plugged in is really helpful. It also allows my, my processor to operate at a higher capacity. And I actually have a little stand that I made out of Jenga blocks that I sit my laptop on to keep it nice and cool. Um, because the cooler my computer is, the faster it works as well. So your computer doesn't have to be shutting down because it's overheating to slow down. It'll slow down and protect itself. So you keep it cool, you keep it elevated, you keep it focused on what it's doing. And by the way, that works for you too. So set up in a place where it works best for you, where you can focus, where you can listen to music if you need to. If there's activity that you need around you to keep you focused, put yourself in a nice, cool, comfortable environment and you and your computer will work better together. All right, I'm gonna end our recording right here. Thank you for the very first live digital demo of the fall 2020 semester, guys. Thank you very much.